Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Patricia Couto. I'm going to be the moderator for this session hosted by the Economic Development Working Group SHIP. And for this session today, we are going to talk about an issue that has been exposed with the current crisis more than ever, economic inequality. Inequality has been systematically ignored by policymakers. A large portion of the population are in a vulnerable position requiring more access to public services in periods of crisis such as the one we are facing. Governments are being required to increase their expenditures to provide the necessary assistance impacting their public debt, which is usually followed by periods of austerity measures and increasing inequalities. To talk about the expected long-term effect on inequality rates post-COVID due to these systematically issues, I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest, Jonathan Ostry. He's the acting director of the Asia and Pacific Department uh, at the International Monetary Fund and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Jonathan Ostry is the author of a number of books and articles in scholarly journals on financial globalization and fiscal sustainability issues. And on his most recent book, Confronting Inequality, he provides empirical evidence on the nexus between income inequality and, and economic growth. And why should we choose a more inclusive economy? After this presentation, we are going to have some time for Q&A, so you can send your questions here in the Zoom chat. Jonathan, uh, welcome to the Young Scholars Initiative Plenary, and the virtual floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you all uh, back in this uh, group. I, I spoke... Uh, at another uh, YSL initiative uh, meeting uh, a couple years ago, I think, but it's it's nice to be back. And um, let me let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, there we go. So. Um, Pleasure to be with you, and and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're uh, where you're located and and joining us from. Um, so I, I'm going to talk uh, pretty much uh, uh, as billed by by Patricia. Um, I'm going to talk about inequality, but I'm going to start out by framing it uh, in terms of the current pandemic and what one might expect uh, uh, to follow from this pandemic. And I'm going to, for that purpose, uh, draw on, on two uh, sources. One is uh, a paper um, that was published uh, very early on in the pandemic, so back in the spring, um, uh, by the CPR on uh, what the experience is from history in terms of the aftermath of pandemics for uh, income inequality, income shares, uh, job losses, and so forth. So looking at the, you know, what would be the, the implications from history for, for the current pandemic, as far as these inequality uh, variables are concerned. But I also want to draw uh, on um, uh, a book that we published last year uh, called Confronting Inequality, uh, written with uh, a few of my colleagues and with a forward by, by Joe Stiglitz. And the reason is I, I think the book uh, helps, will help with the, with the narrative and the discussion of whether, um, you know, the prologue uh, provided by this pandemic is, um, you know, things will, will evolve differently uh, based on history, or whether um, uh, or whether things will be different this time. So whether the past will be a prologue or not. So those are the going to be the two sources. Um, and to to set up, um, you know, what the takeaways um, are. Um, what we what we find in the first paper is that. Indeed, major epidemics in this century have tended to raise inequality. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, more than anecdotal, but, but certainly anecdotal evidence uh, that is already available 
um, to support the notion that those at the bottom, the most uh, initially vulnerable, are those uh, already getting hit the hardest, including uh, young people, including women, including uh, folks with um, limited educational uh, attainment and so forth. Um, and then to ask, you know, as I said, uh, is the past going to be uh, prologue? What should we expect um, for inequality in the post-COVID world? Um, and that's going to depend on a, on a lot of things. Um, you know, uh, obviously it's going to depend on, on how the pandemic plays out. Um, and there's a lot on that uh, that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but uh, we, we do have another paper that I will not talk about on uh, the risk of, of second and, and nth waves. And we're already seeing second waves in uh, different parts of the world. Um, so, so that's going to be an important, uh, an important thing that I won't talk about. But I, I will talk about a, a bunch of other things um, uh, that I think are, are salient, leaving aside the epidemiology um, uh, for the most part. And the first is really, um, is there going to be a will to, uh, to confront the problems that are, that are surfacing anew during this pandemic, but um, that, were, that were very much festering in the background uh, long before the pandemic? Um, so, uh, you know, of course, we, 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 uh, we hope uh, very much that the, um, the will to deal with these problems on the part of policymakers, which has been uh, expressed over and over again in the past several months, that that will will not sort of fade away as so often has been the case uh, in the past. Um, uh, and, um, you know, that is, that is our, our hope. It's our hope also, you know, stepping back a little bit because high or rising inequality is uh, very much antithetical to, uh, to sustainable growth. So uh, even, even, you know, I, I always give this message because uh, people, people have very different uh, views um, in societies around the world and within, within national uh, uh, jurisdictions about uh, the toxicity of inequality. Some people uh, think, you know, there are different social contracts around the world, uh, and different different people, uh, you know, have different perspectives on, uh, you know, whether the genie, uh, a genie, a genie that is elevated for some people might not seem uh, so bad for others. And um, but what everyone. Uh, seems to agree with, including especially um, uh, elites and political leaders that that don't, uh, you know, think inequality is a huge problem. Uh, they do want to uh, set up a system that generates um, sustained and sustainable increases in prosperity over time. And so the message that uh, uh, you you can't simply as a recipe for successful policy say, let's just get growth going. Inequality will uh, ultimately take care of itself. Uh, the message from our work is that uh, history does not support uh, that notion. Inequality does not take care of itself and high or rising inequality um, is antithetical to sustained increases in prosperity. So even if you uh, are willing to tolerate or you even like um, because of purported incentive effects or whatever, uh, high levels of inequality, um, you should be aware that um, such high levels of inequality will be an impediment uh, to economic growth. And if that's the thing you're concerned about, then you need to be concerned uh, about inequality. But, but I do want to, I don't want to be Panglossian here at all. I, I think the message from history is that, um, uh, you know, the, the um, intentions that are expressed in the teeth of a pandemic or an economic crisis to confront this problem 
do in fact tend to fade away uh, after the pandemic is over. Um, and so um, this time would need to be different for the outcome to be different. Um, the other thing I, 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 I do want to draw on uh, uh, my book uh, about is how we, how we design uh, globalization. So we all have, uh, are aware that, um, you know, this, this, uh, this crisis has, uh, has put pressure on, uh, on globalization, uh, trade in goods, uh, has uh, plunged uh, this year. And while we expect uh, a recovery, uh, a bounce back to some degree next year, um, we don't expect over the medium term uh, trade to be the engine for economic growth that was so effective uh, at lifting so many out of global poverty in the past. We don't expect trade to be uh, the, the, that kind of an engine to the same degree in the years to come. Um, but I don't, I don't want to talk about trade or indeed about migration. Um, I want to talk uh, a bit about um, financial globalization, which is something that uh, gets talked about far too little, uh, in my opinion, uh, when we come to uh, to the issue of what kind of a globalization we want to craft uh, after this pandemic. And the reason it, it, um, it is important to talk more about it is that that particular aspect of globalization, globalization of financial flows, has, been, um, has presented much worse equity efficiency trade-offs than other aspects of globalization. So, if you think of globalization as trade, as something that is a very effective instrument um, at growing the pie um, and uh, may lead to um, uh, increases even uh, for those at the bottom of the income scale, which I believe it has done. Um, when you think of financial globalization, the evidence seems to suggest that, um, uh, that the payoff in terms of a larger pie has been uh, de minimis, but the um, impact on inequality has been palpable. So the equity efficiency trade-off for that kind, that aspect of globalization uh, is, is, not, is not favorable. And we should think about um, uh, whether, that, uh, whether we can uh, tweak the way we, uh, we designed the rules for uh, uh, global cross-border finance in a way that leads to a better uh, equity efficiency trade-off. Um, the third issue, uh, and this is one that, that uh, Patricia mentioned in, uh, in her introductory remarks, has to do with um, uh, the uh, response to rising public debt. So um, this crisis has led to, has led governments to spend hand over fist um, on uh, supporting their economies and uh, fortunately also supporting uh, the most vulnerable in societies. Uh, at a global level, we're up to something like $12 trillion uh, in, uh, in uh, pledged fiscal support so far. And that will have a very, uh, a very serious uh, impact on, uh, on public debt levels. Um, uh, and yet, and yet uh, the message from, uh, from the IMF and from others is uh, not to pull the plug on that uh, fiscal support prematurely um, on the grounds that to do so will actually be self-defeating. If, um, if, uh, if you pull the plug before the recovery is on the rails, has, has solid legs and is, and is entrenched, uh, you will actually uh, 
um, wind up with uh, worse paths for the economy and worse paths for public debt. So it is really a self-defeating policy. And so a message uh, is, is not to uh, embark on fiscal consolidation or as some folks prefer to say, not to uh, uh, jump into austerity uh, before, before the recovery um, is entrenched. Uh, and I, I uh, very much will echo uh, that perspective also because of some of the work um, we did in our book, which I will talk about. And then lastly, I, I, will, I will conclude with this. I will say a little bit about the fact, which I think is very important, which is episodes like the one we are going through often leads, lead to uh, periods of uh, accelerated automation and robotization. Uh, and that uh, such episodes, while they uh, uh, will tend to uh, increase aggregate productivity, uh, they tend to hurt precisely those people who are already being uh, worst affected by the pandemic, uh, those with less skills, less education, low, those uh, who already earn uh, less informal workers, women and the youth. So that's the, that's the game plan. And uh, again, um, the, uh, the, the central issue really for me is, will this time be different? And my answer is no, unless, unless dot, 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 attitudes and policies uh, really change. Uh, globalization is restored with inclusiveness in mind. Uh, public debt is pared back slowly rather than a knee-jerk return to austerity. austerity and the gains from automation are widely shared in society. Okay, so let me, uh, let me start with the first part. Um, and uh, there's, there is a, 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 a considerable literature, uh, which has actually grown since I, I put together this uh, slide uh, some, some time ago. Uh, and, and these are uh, uh, some of the of the key papers that came uh, early in uh, in the pandemic uh, that are already in the in the public domain. Um, our our work is going to focus on uh, five five pandemics that have occurred um, in the past several decades. Um, uh, SARS. Uh, H1N1, uh, which you may prefer to call the swine flu, uh, MERS, Zika, and Ebola. Um, uh, a number of these were had a regional concentration, but um, the swine flu was a was a, a global global event. Um, and we're going to uh, use WHO data uh, to identify. Um, these events, uh, and so we'll create uh, a dummy variable, a pandemic dummy, um, uh, based on the WHO declarations. And then we're going to uh, basically trace uh, the impact um, of the pandemic on uh, income distribution and, uh, and employment. Uh, we, uh, we use um, uh, Fred Soltz uh, uh, SWID uh, database, which is, um, for all of its detractors, uh, the very best uh, database uh, available to undertake exercises of this, uh, of this type. It is a broad uh, cross-country database on inequality, and that key word, uh, in the acronym S for standardized is absolutely uh, of the essence. Uh, other databases exist, but they are not standardized. Um, and for those of you who get into the weeds on this stuff, there is a very uh, active academic debate, often very, uh, very vociferous uh, on uh, different data sources for inequality. Um, but certainly uh, for the exercise 
uh, we have in mind, this is the only game in town and a, and a very helpful contribution. Uh, for a smaller group of countries, we'll be able to look at income shares by decile uh, and we'll, we'll draw on the WDI for that. And we, we're also interested, you know, in, in, uh, in job losses by education level, unemployment, um, and there, uh, you know, the very helpful work by the ILO is, is really essential. But again, it's, uh, it's for a subset of the, of the total uh, 175 countries in the SWID database. So it's, uh, it's for 76 and for the WDI is for, for 64. Uh, countries um, and uh, this is an annual an annual exercise and we uh, are uh, not uh, seeking to be inventive on the methodological front we are going to uh, use Oscar Jorda's celebrated uh, local projection method to generate our uh, is, uh, our impulse response impulse responses um, for, uh, for uh, the different distributional variables uh, of interest. Um, and we're going to be looking um, five years out. Um, and, you know, uh, we think it's important not to look less than five years. It may be important uh, to look more, but obviously there, there are trade-offs. So we, we are going to look uh, five years out. Um, and uh, here, uh, the left-hand side is the, the distributional variable of interest. Um, there are country and time effects uh, in the model. Uh, D is the, is the pandemic uh, dummy. And uh, X is uh, a group of uh, controls. Um, and uh, there are different different versions of the model uh, baseline and, and ones with a uh, very uh, much augmented set of controls. Um, the findings are, are pretty robust um, uh, to, uh, you know, including uh, more controls, but that is not meant to be a, a definitive statement. Uh, other people who want to fool around with this model um, should feel free uh, to do so uh, and add uh, additional controls if they feel there are some that uh, we have omitted. I, I, I'll refer you to the, to the published paper and the data that are available uh, on that. Um, but I do want to... Uh, say something about the, the second model uh, at the bottom of the page, which um, has some additional uh, controls, which essentially uh, interact the pandemic dummy with um, uh, some variable that captures uh, the state of the economy. And the, I, I'm, I'm being deliberately vague in uh, using that word. So the state of the economy could be uh, some picture of the business cycle. Uh, it could be um, some picture of fiscal policy. It could be uh, some picture of healthcare spending. It could be a variety of different things that um, we have a prior belief uh, might be a channel through which uh, the pandemic affects the distributional variables uh, of interest. And obviously, um, these, uh, these uh, channels, um, they are not sort of zero one, and we need a, we need a method uh, that allows us to, um, to have kind of a smooth transi transition uh, along uh, a continuum of different states of the economy. Um, and that is what these, uh, these interactions with smooth transition functions, these, these F functions uh, are doing. Um, and I, I, this isn't a technical uh, group, so I, I'm not gonna say more uh, from, uh, about that, but it will become clearer what I'm talking about in just a few minutes. Um, so, so let me just uh, uh, jump to uh, the results. Um, 
which is to say that this is a picture of the impulse response and the, and the solid line, uh, red line is, is the impulse response and the, the shaded areas uh, are, the, are the confidence bands. And what you see is a building uh, effect on, on inequality. It builds over time. So you have the, um, the market genie uh, before taxes and transfers on the left and the post-tax and transfers uh, genie on the right. And I hope many of you are thinking, oh, Jonathan's got this backwards. Surely he's mislabeled these two pictures. It must be the case um, if, if, um, if fiscal policy is helping to protect the, mo the most vulnerable that um, the increase in the post-tax and transfer genie is smaller rather than larger than the increase in the pre-tax and transfer genie. So let me just say that based on the data we have, um, and I think it does, uh, it does jive quite well with some of the anecdotal evidence that, that is emerging. No, this isn't, this isn't a mistake. Uh, in fact, uh, great intentions aside, it looks like the post-tax and transfer genie actually increases by more than uh, the pre-tax and transfer genie. Now, lest you think that um, uh, Jorda's local projection method um, is responsible for these finding, findings, uh, we, we check them against an alternative method, um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, augmented distributed lag method, autoregressive distributed lag method of that Romer and Romer use in their AER paper on fiscal, uh, on fiscal shocks. And again, the results um, are, uh, are the same, effectively. They're, they're very, very similar. Um, and uh, here is uh, a model with some additional controls. So let me just give you an example of, um, of uh, what motivated us to add some of these addi additional controls, which is simply that um, there are many other factors that might also be evolving in the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, like, you know, uh, like globalization, you know, there might be changes in, in trade or in financial globalization um, uh, that might, that might uh, have quite similar effects uh, to the pandemic. So you would want to control, given the risk of omitted variable bias, for... Um, for as many of these variables as you can think of, uh, you know, share of population uh, in, in, in urbanization, uh, you know, development level uh, and so forth. And so this is a, a, a very rich model that has a whole slew of additional controls, but uh, ultimately it does not, it does not uh, change uh, the picture, uh, which is uh, of, a building increase in inequality uh, that is both economically and statistically uh, significant. Um, some people might say, well, all of your pandemics uh, uh, have occurred in the post-2000 uh, uh, period. Uh, so what happens uh, if you restrict your sample to that later period? And again, uh, nothing, nothing really uh, changes uh, at all. Um, and then, uh, you know, remember that second, uh, that second model um, uh, that um, uh, has those uh, smooth transition functions interacting the, the dummy with, um, with the state of the economy. And here the state is, is GDP growth. So you can think about uh, pandemics that are associated with very deep recessions and those uh, that are not. And obviously what you see is that the increases in inequality are, uh, are uh, larger uh, and uh, economically and statistically uh, more significant uh, in, the, in the ones with deep recessions, uh, but that if uh, such recessions are avoided, then there isn't really uh, 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 much of an effect on inequality 
uh, at all, as you see in the right-hand panel. Uh, and then uh, moving to a different, uh, a different interaction variable, you can see that basically when the authorities um, are, uh, are, you know, spend hefty amounts on health expenditures, the increase in inequality is very much contained, uh, but uh, again, uh, much larger than in the baseline in the left panel uh, when uh, expenditures are, are low. Um, and again, uh, we tend to think that uh, the very generous fiscal support that has been, that has been provided has helped uh, to, um, to prevent much deeper recessions, but it's also helped to protect uh, the most vulnerable and contain the increase in inequality. And indeed, that is, that is what we see in the historical data, that, um, uh, that the rise in inequality is much larger in high austerity or low deficit regimes and much more contained and not statistically different from zero in uh, low austerity, high deficit uh, regimes. Um, we, we, we are not wedded to looking at the Gini. We look at the Gini because it's the most, it's the broadest uh, measure that we have uh, in terms of the country coverage, but we can look at income deciles and we see uh, that basically pandemics uh, seem to uh, lead to uh, increases in the income shares going to the top and obviously decreases in income shares uh, going to the bottom. Um, uh, so that, that is what these, and you can measure the top or the bottom uh, pretty much however you like. Uh, you can do uh, top and top, top tens, top ones, uh, bottom, bottom tens, uh, and, and so forth. Now, you know, many people are, are going to be thinking about, uh, about the why. Why does, uh, you know, pandemics are, affect everybody. Why does it affect those with, who start out with weaker initial conditions more uh, than the rich or the highly educated? And, you know, th this, uh, this picture gives uh, some, some food for thought. Um, uh, in terms of uh, showing the kinds of jobs uh, um, that uh, allow people to work from home um, and, uh, you know, the extent to which those jobs are done by poor people or rich people. And, and really, uh, you are not going to be surprised, but really, um, uh, people like me can, can work at home and, and uh, not much really changes in terms of uh, my capacity to, to earn a living. But uh, uh, many people uh, in weaker uh, uh, situations have to actually physically go to work. Uh, and that has um, uh, a bunch of effects uh, in terms of uh, whether they'll experience job losses, whether they'll uh, get uh, put their health in harm's way, whether um, if they put their health in harm's way, they'll have access to health care, whether if they don't have access to health care, they will die, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a picture that I think is, is well known to, to all of you. Um, so, so who does, whose jobs uh, are in jeopardy in this situation? And what you see here based on the ILO data is uh, a very clear story that those with advanced or, or intermediate skills uh, and education suffer much less in terms of uh, job losses uh, in the aftermath of pandemics, but those, uh, those at the bottom uh, suffer much more and, um, and uh, their, their job losses tend to be persistent. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that um, uh, also when, when I talk about uh, the risks in terms of automation and robotization. Um, so, you know, just to, to say a little bit about some of this uh, anecdotal e evidence uh, and, and some of this may be uh, familiar uh, uh, to you in, in New York City, um, for example, poor people are, are much less likely to test negative 
um, uh, their mortality rates are higher for African Americans. This is especially the case. Uh, poor people tend to be uh, in jobs uh, that where working at home, working from home, is simply not possible. Um, uh, and this is especially uh, true uh, for African Americans, as far as the American uh, population is concerned. Um, and you know, uh, this is not some some flash in the pan. This is not something that is short lived. Um, uh, the 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 human costs uh, tend to be uh, highly persistent. Um, they can stretch over uh, years and decades uh, into the future, and they they don't just uh, uh, you know impinge upon economic variables. They affect life expectancy. Uh, they uh, affect uh, human capital development and educational uh, uh, achievement of, of children. Uh, they, can, they affect social cohesion. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there, uh, there is emerging work um, uh, that is suggesting that um, uh, social unrest is, uh, is very much um, uh, a possibility if, uh, if I, rising inequality following this pandemic is uh, is allowed to fester uh, and not uh, and not uh, addressed. Um, so so these these are uh, concerns that are going to be with us for for some time to come. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, you know this first part of the of the presentation, uh, pandemics have raised inequality and diminished the job prospects for the less skilled. Um, and you may ask again, coming back to this idea that pandemics should be great levelers. Um, and if you think of uh, historical episodes going much further uh, uh, in the past, like the Black Death, um, uh, they were great levelers. Um, and and why, why, why are things so different today? Um, and, and, you know, one key reason uh, that uh, they are different is simply that um, in uh, centuries ago, uh, the mechanism through which uh, uh, pandemics were great levelers was that um, so many people uh, died. Um, there was no medical care. There was science was was not able to save people, uh, and most of the people who died were were unskilled labor, and so unskilled labor became uh, scarcer. And the law of economics uh, uh, prevails, and um, we were able to see uh, some increase in uh, in the incomes going to the unskilled because there were so many fewer uh, of them. Today, fortunately, we we do have uh, uh, better medical care, and uh, and why and while hundreds of thousands of people um, have died. Um, it is not the millions and uh, millions that we saw uh, centuries ago. And of course, that is a good thing, but it also means that uh, pandemics are not the great leveler that we saw centuries ago. Um, and, uh, you know, let me, let me also just uh, say that many of, uh, of our colleagues uh, think uh, this, this time will not be different. Um, that, um, you know, if you poll economists, they do think that inequality uh, will increase. Uh, there is anecdotal evidence uh, certainly pointing in this uh, direction during the current uh, uh, pandemic. So it is, it is worth asking whether this time uh, will, will be different. I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, you know, not repeat uh, some of the questions that I've posed earlier. Uh, but let me let me just um, uh, say that you know I, I mentioned at the beginning that certainly there are a lot of noises to suggest that this time could be different. I mean, uh, there are these quotes um, from uh, you know an editorial in the Financial Times that occurred um, very early in the pandemic, which certainly um, uh, seems to uh, to call for. Uh, uh, you know, real action to uh, uh, deal with these issues, talking for um, uh, reversing uh, the prevailing policy direction of the past decades, for more redistribution, for basic income, uh, and more wealth taxes, etc. Um, 
And, you know, um, uh, millionaires and billionaires have also jumped on this bandwagon uh, saying, you know, now is our chance to do the right thing. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to have genuine uh, equality of opportunity uh, and we need a radical rethink of, of government policy to benefit uh, the common good. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, this is important, not just of itself, i.e. not uh, because morally high levels of inequality uh, seem abhorrent to some, if not, if not everybody, um, but because, uh, uh, you know, sustained economic growth uh, seems antithetical to high levels of inequality and societies uh, have a track record of growing uh, much more sustainably at a healthy clip uh, when they don't have high levels of, uh, of inequality. Um, uh, and basically, um, inequality to be sure is not the only thing that hampers uh, the sustainability of growth. So this is the, the, the relationship uh, um, uh, in, a, uh, in a multivariate setting, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, relate uh, different uh, uh, factors to uh, the durability of growth spells that countries have experienced over the past uh, decades. And, uh, uh, you know, many things that, um, that are dear to proponents of the Washington Consensus, like trade openness, like openness to foreign direct investment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, do, do figure in, uh, in the uh, empirical evidence, but uh, very much income distribution uh, and greater equality of the in income distribution seems to be protective of the sustainability of economic growth. And for those who think that um, cures to high inequality uh, may be worse than the disease itself in terms of the growth impact, uh, uh, our, my finding in, in the book and in and some earlier papers suggests that this is uh, largely a red herring, uh, that uh, at least on average in the data, and I stress this is an average finding, it doesn't mean uh, that extreme redistribution would not have uh, sizable disincentive effects uh, in some environments, but on average in the data, uh, redistribution's impact on the, the sustainability and the level of economic growth uh, does not seem to be uh, particularly salient at all. Um, so then this, uh, this basic question, um, uh, you know, what is the world we want uh, to uh, create uh, tomorrow? And what, how do we want to set the stage today for that world uh, if, we don't, if we don't want history to uh, repeat itself? Now, globalization, um, you know, has, has evolved during this pandemic uh, in terms of, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've seen disruptions to supply chains. We've seen countries that rely on tourism uh, to be amongst the hardest hit in the world. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, an unprecedented uh, retrenchment of capital flows away from emerging markets. Uh, that makes the global financial crisis uh, look like a picnic. Um, and we've seen uh, declines in immigration. So there has been some uh, effects on globalization across the board so far during this pandemic. Um, but globalization uh, is many things. Um, and the question is, uh, while we recognize that some aspects of globalization um, uh, have been very helpful in, uh, in bringing so many billions out of poverty. Uh, and it would thus be uh, a very uh, bad idea to uh, throw the whole globalization baby out uh, uh, with uh, the bathwater. Um, we do have an opportunity to, uh, to craft a globalization uh, that is more inclusive uh, for the future. Um, so, you know, uh, Danny Roderick um, uh, has, uh, has made the point that the hyper-globalization of recent years 
has not uh, necessarily been uh, a good thing and some retreat from that uh, might well be uh, a, a good thing. And, and we should consider uh, different aspects of globalization um, and which ones uh, lead to inclusive globalization uh, and which uh, less so. Uh, and I'm not gonna be able to talk about this comprehensively, but I will say something about uh, financial globalization, um, which I think, um, frankly, um, uh, has been getting uh, uh, a lot of heat uh, and, uh, and justifiably so. Uh, what, we, what we find is that um, uh, financial globalization is the aspect of globalization uh, that um, has delivered a relatively less on average in terms of growing the size of the pie, uh, but it, uh, it leads to uh, a higher uh, inequality. Countries that open up to foreign capital have tended to experience uh, higher inequality. Um, and uh, a lot of my work has focused on understanding the mechanisms, but a key one is that uh, when capital can leave countries, uh, the bargaining power of labor um, uh, is very much reduced. And that is why uh, inequality rises, why labor shares uh, uh, decline, and why uh, the uh, top shares uh, benefit so much at the expense uh, of the bottom shares. Uh, and I, I showed you the, the genie uh, on this picture, um, and I showed you, uh, show you here uh, the effects on uh, income shares on the left panel uh, and on uh, uh, the labor share in national income uh, on the right panel. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, area that I think we do have to worry about is, uh, is austerity. Um, and uh, the initial, uh, the initial uh, response to the pandemic is is a, is a bright spot. Um, countries uh, have done an enormous amount within their fiscal means um, to support uh, the, uh, the economy at this difficult time and to support uh, the most vulnerable. Um, so this is, this is uh, very much uh, a good thing. Um, and we know the perils of, uh, of engaging in consolidation uh, too early. Um, you know, there's this idea um, that uh, consolidations uh, can be uh, uh, expansionary, but that is very much not uh, the likely scenario. Countries, of course, don't engage in consolidation typically uh, because uh, they want to, or because they expect it will increase economic growth, or because they expect it will reduce inequality and help the poor. They do so typically because they have to, and everyone understands that. Uh, but we should understand, uh, eyes wide open, that, uh, that consolidation is likely to have uh, significant in in adverse impacts on both uh, income inequality and uh, on and unemployment, uh, and this is this is uh, very much the finding of uh, of our work. Um, the, the last the last thing I want to say uh, about this is that often often events of this type uh, lead to uh, increased automation. Everyone has gone uh, to. Uh, the supermarket and to the self-checkout line and uh, avoided seeing um, any human being uh, when they come to pay for their groceries during this pandemic. And, and the point is that um, events of this type, uh, events like, like pandemics uh, often lead to much more automation and those who suffer the most tend to be uh, unskilled uh, or, or lower skilled. Uh, workers and uh, there, there, t there tend to be the data that that uh, we have looked at uh, suggests that there are important thresholds effect uh, threshold effects that if uh, inequality is already pretty high uh, the risks from uh, events of this type in terms of precipitating big increases in automation and big job losses for the less skilled 
are tend to be uh, higher. Um, and it's, it's also higher when countries already have quite a bit of robotization. So there's a threshold effect in terms of the, uh, the uh, initial level of robotization going into an event uh, like this. And, and both of these factors, I think, are also um, uh, should make us worried about, uh, about higher social uh, unrest. So here, what we, we show based on, uh, on the model in the book is uh, the fact that really um, the unskilled are those that, uh, that lose the most out of increases uh, in, in automation. And so let me, let me uh, really conclude recognizing that, um, that I've gone a bit over my allotted time. Uh, past major epidemics have increased inequality. Uh, we asked the question, will this time be different? And our answer is uh, no, uh, unless attitudes and policies uh, really change. Talk in that sense is cheap. Uh, no, unless globalization is restored with inclusiveness in mind. No, unless public debt is paid, pared back slowly rather than uh, with a knee jerk uh, uh, return to austerity. And no, unless uh, the gains from automation are uh, widely shared. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for your presentation. A lot of food for thought, a lot of food for thought. At the same time, it's so great to see all the evidence related to inequality, but at the same time, it's so sad to see that sometimes our policymakers are doing quite the opposite, especially during this crisis. But I have a couple of questions, and um, I think the first one is related, you said in one of your slides that even uh, CEOs are saying we need to invest in common ground. And the thing is that uh, this crisis highlighted the inequality issue and everyone is talking about that. Everyone's agreed that we need to do something about it. But the problem is what do we need to do about it? That's when people get different opinions about how to tackle this issue. So for example, when we talk about that, people were saying, okay, we need it during a crisis, we need to invest in common ground. For the CEO, sometimes it's less taxes, uh, subsidies for their business, because they need to invest and create more jobs. So people have different opinions about what they need to do during this crisis to invest in common ground. So someone who has all uh, decades of research in inequality and you research about this common ground, what you can say uh, to these people, policymakers, uh, CEOs, and everyone who is researching about that, what, you, what is your definition about common ground that can tackle a crisis and inequality at the same time? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, so, uh, I think I would say I would say a couple things. Um, the I, I have been impressed uh, by how much uh, has been done so far. Um, uh, when you compare the amount of fiscal stimulus, uh, fiscal resources that have been devoted to dealing with this, it's it's uh, much larger. Uh, than what we saw in the global financial crisis, um, which was uh, at the time, if you recall, really considered to be a, a very vigorous response. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I think we, we have to acknowledge what has been done. The problem is that um, as we we're discovering, this pandemic is not going away fast. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is going to be, um, it's going to be with us for a while. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we, we will need, we will need to sustain the political will, uh, to, con to continue with, uh, with policies that will be supportive of, uh, the most vulnerable and the economy as a whole, uh, going forward. Um, it's important given that this uh, crisis is gonna be with us for a while, this health crisis is gonna be with us for a while, first of all, that we, we never lose sight of, of the health crisis. 
Uh, this is first and foremost uh, a health crisis. It's not like the global financial crisis. Um, it's, you know, the, the, those are very, very different episodes. Um, and really the epidemiology is a boss. Um, we are not in control. People sitting in national treasuries or central banks are not in control of this, of this disease. Uh, the disease is, is in charge. Um, and we, uh, we have to make sure that health policy uh, is always uh, trying to keep the disease down, to suppress the disease, because we cannot have um, a sustained and durable recovery uh, with the disease going crazy. Uh, so so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, governments have been spending a lot um, and we have said, don't pull the plug on that uh, too soon. But at the same time, if this crisis as seems likely is gonna last a long time, uh, we, we have to have a vision of where we are going uh, with all of this. Spending. Um, and, uh, you know, at the beginning, we threw lifelines to everybody. Uh, uh, you know, we, we supported everybody. Um, uh, increasingly, we, we have to do better at targeting the support to the most vulnerable. We cannot, uh, uh, those are the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable companies, but not vulnerable companies that are like these zombies, not, not companies uh, that, uh, that need to go under because they have no chance of, um, of getting back on their feet. Uh, they are already insolvent. We need to support com companies that are um, uh, illiquid, but who once the recovery um, is underway, will be solvent. So we need to think creatively about taking equ equity-like stakes uh, in, these, in these companies uh, that have a good chance of, um, of being uh, uh, good companies in the world of tomorrow. And, and for that, we have to have a vision of the world of tomorrow. We, we, we should not, in the policies that we put in place, try and recreate the world of yesterday. That's, um, that's both about not, um, not saving, not you know, having a whole group of zombie firms um, uh, that, that will need to go under. You don't want them to go under at the beginning of a crisis, but if this crisis is gonna last a long time, you, you can't help everybody. So, so you're gonna need to have a view about who, who will need to be helped, who will not need to be helped. Um, and you also need to have a vision of what kind of society you want to create. So everybody wants to create a uh, greener society, one where investments are, um, are going to um, uh, uh, lead to more uh, uh, green, uh, less dirty uh, growth in the future. And uh, importantly, ones where, um, uh, you know, growth is more inclusive. So it doesn't just benefit those at the top. Uh, and that, uh, that means we have to seriously consider uh, more progressivity in the taxes. We have to consider um, uh, tax loopholes. We have to consider uh, that, uh, that companies have to pay their fair share, that, they, uh, that they, we, the, the different jurisdictions of the world cooperate to make sure that there is uh, uh, not uh, loopholes so that, uh, you know, companies do not uh, avoid paying their fair share. So that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. And of course, you talked about the whole fiscal adjustment and the impact on increasing inequalities and uh, how this can harm uh, these inequality rates. And of course, I need to ask you as someone from IMF, your personal view as a researcher and as someone inside the IMF, because uh, there was a lot of critics about these austerity measures that usually hurt the most vulnerable part of the population um, that comes from the IMF as a, a requirement for loans because of course we have this crisis that is coming and it's not going away any for, uh, like it's not going away any soon so 
we will have a time that uh, developing countries especially are going to need help and of course they are going to uh, IMF to get this help and the critiques in the past was related to that. So as someone from inside the IMF and someone who is researching inequality, what changes do you see inside the organizations that can help to change this future related to policies that can impact inequality? Very good question. Thank you for it. Um, so we have already seen a, a, a change in the sense that um, the IMF has provided really, really fast uh, an unprecedented level of support to an unprecedented uh, number of countries. Really fast uh, um, and, uh, and, and serious, serious amounts. Um, and we have done so uh, really without uh, any of the traditional conditionality um, uh, that um, uh, normally um, is involved in, uh, in, in our lending operations. And the reason uh, we have been able to do this is because everybody understands that um, people who uh, need liquidity, countries that need liquidity uh, in this environment uh, need it uh, owing to no nothing that they themselves, uh, they, they themselves are not the cause of uh, needing financial support. This is a, a global pandemic and they have been hit. Uh, and so it makes no sense to say these policy changes are needed uh, essentially as collateral for the financial resources that we are going to invest. Uh, none of that um, uh, has been involved uh, this time. We have only asked two things, two things. One is that the money uh, that we provide is used to help uh, the most vulnerable and help your country to deal with the pandemic. That's one. And secondly, because we are concerned always about governance issues and corruption, we have used the expression, save the receipts. So um, we have asked for a high degree of transparency about how the money that has been provided is used. Uh, those are the, really the only two things uh, that, that um, have been involved in providing financial resources. Now, um, going forward, as, as also your question, um, this pandemic may, uh, may be with us for quite some time and the needs uh, uh, of uh, countries uh, will change and the needs for policy adjustments uh, will change. Um, and uh, we will have to recognize that on a country by country basis. Um, but what you have heard um, uh, from the IMF is very much the message that um, don't uh, turn off the fiscal tap prematurely is not my message, that's the IMF's message. So I think in terms of the messaging, uh, it is very clear where we stand. Um, and, then, and then we will have to look at the changing needs of countries uh, as we go forward uh, and this, uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic. Perfect. Thank you. And of course, now uh, a lot needs to change and talking about not only the IMF, but the whole multilateral actions and um, the whole multilateral uh, parts in this crisis. What do you think still needs to change in either advising uh, developing countries or what, what do you think that it needs to change considering the whole inequality aspects from now on? Yeah, so um, I, would, I would say that, uh, you know, it's, it's the responsibility of every country to first ask uh, what it can do for its, uh, for its national citizens uh, to uh, reverse large increases in inequality and to uh, prevent um, uh, the vulnerable um, from being, uh, you know, hit the hardest. Um, so, um, you know, as important as global cooperation is in many, many different 
uh, ways. Um, there is a lot, uh, I would say that uh, national inequalities, rising national inequalities uh, are first and foremost a, a national responsibility. It's the responsibility of governments uh, to deal with this problem and it's the responsibility of citizens to keep the pressure uh, on those governments to um, not just uh, talk the talk, but walk the walk as well. Um, and it means, uh, you know, uh, many things that, that I talked about in my presentation. It means um, uh, making sure that social safety nets are, are adequate and they really do reach um, uh, uh, the people who are hit the hardest, including uh, women, including young people. Uh, it means that, um, you know, uh, bringing informal workers, which is a huge issue in so many developing countries, um, uh, into the formal economy and making sure that safety nets uh, can actually uh, reach everybody that they need to reach. So uh, leveraging digital technologies, uh, national ID systems, and all of these things to really uh, get cash and in-kind uh, uh, in -kind help uh, to people who uh, actually need it. Uh, it. It means um, uh, making sure that uh, we, we have mechanisms to, uh, to contain and reverse uh, the erosion of human capital development uh, that, uh, that the pandemic is uh, creating. I mean, schools have been closed, kids can't go to school. This hurts mostly uh, the people at the bottom and precisely in an environment where, um, uh, you know, skills are gonna be more in demand uh, in the future uh, if automation increases and robotization increases. So we have to worry, uh, we have to worry. And we have to, um, we have to, uh, do basic things to make sure that um, everybody pays their share uh, and that we have progressive taxes so that uh, the rich pay their share and share and companies pay their share. But we, we, much of this is just the responsibility of national governments. Cooperation is important. And I think on uh, the, the one aspect of globalization uh, that, that uh, I, I talked to in a little depth in the, in the in the presentation was financial globalization, where I, I do think that uh, there's an opportunity. There are some uh, types of financial flow that, um, that seem much more uh, uh, helpful in terms of growing the pie uh, without engendering um, uh, increases in inequality. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, like foreign direct investment, I, I think there are things that we can do uh, uh, on the on the global uh, level to try and uh, encourage some kinds of flows and discourage uh, other kinds of flows. And I think the IMF has been uh, uh, at the forefront of some of this work uh, uh, beginning a, a decade ago. Um, um, so so I, I would I would mention that as well. Perfect. Thank you. And the last question is, um, during the plenary, we're exploring new economic questions to inspire young scholars' futures projects. So based on your research, what questions still needs to be answered? And what are the most prominent questions that need our attention now? Well, I think, I think to me, one of the most interesting questions is is outside of narrow economics. It's more about political economy. How do we, uh, how do we, and particularly young people who are, um, so not me, but uh, young people uh, who are in this audience, how do you um, uh, create the right incentives for uh, political elites and economic elites uh, to change course? Um, so how do, what is the right mix of carrots and sticks um, to uh, make uh, the world of tomorrow uh, different? Because um, really, uh, you know, elites are elites and they will 
they will act ultimately in a way that um, that is good for them. Um, so you have to, we collectively have to find a way uh, to make what is good for the collective and good for them, for those two things to have something in common. Um, so we have to understand, you know, how, how uh, is it, is it the threat, is it threats of the fact that, um, you know, the pitchforks, is it, is it the fact that, um, you know, the, the model of yesterday that has favored the elites mostly, that that model is not sustainable? Um, uh, do, do, is, that, is that the point that has to be made? Is it that um, uh, things like sustainable, like saving the planet, uh, which seems to be the, one of the most important issues of our time, that that's, that's actually important, uh, uh, not just for the health and well-being of everybody, but also for sustainable growth. So we have to think of what will incentivize uh, decision makers to, to make decisions that are in the interests of everybody. Because I think uh, the majority of people know what needs to be done, but the, the problem is that the, it hasn't been done. And that must be in the realm of political economy. Why has it been done? And how can we actually change the political economy uh, so that uh, we get decisions that are, that are beneficial for everybody? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation. There's a lot of food for thought. And thank you for accepting our invitation. And this is it. Uh, this was the economic impact of inequality session. And I hope you all have a great day. Bye. Thanks very much, Patricia. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.